God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Welcome everybody to Bethany's worship service this morning. It is good to be with you as always. A few announcements before we begin. We have a youth group today that is meeting at 8.30 uh, instead of 2 o'clock today. We will be helping out pass, uh, we will be helping to pass out Christmas baskets to families in our charge. And speaking of Christmas baskets, if you ordered one for your family, today is the day to pick them up again. We will uh, be passing them out between 3.30 and 4.30. These are baskets that are designed for families with children. And there may even be an older uh, jolly helper to present them to you with us. And you don't want to miss this if you and your family did order one. But if something does happen to come up and you're unable to leave your basket, please Give me a call so that we can arrange another pickup time or drop off time. Our mission uh, to help Epworth Children's Home is going well. As you know, we are raising supplies for Epworth as part of uh, the season of Advent, the season of anticipation, and sort of the fulfillment of God's mission here on earth with the sending of Christ. And as always, we are making this a competition between Clemson fans and University of South Carolina fans. At the end of the collection period, which is January 10th, the team who has gathered the most bags, uh, and there's been a little bit of contention about this. Some people have said, well, we don't have enough uniform bags, Pastor Hillary, you know, would you consider some other type of way? So I'm thinking that we're gonna have to transition it to the team with the most items. The team with the most items will win bread and white breads for the year, but they will also see me dressed in the, uh, the team colors and the team logo during the worship service. And this year I'm also upping the ante. The team that raises the most items for at both children's home will receive a uh, spring uh, watch party uh, for the spring game of the team's choosing. So that could be anything from basketball to baseball to uh, cricket or rugby, uh, if any of those places have those, uh, those, uh, those types of teams, and they can be found on ESPN. Uh, my commitment to you is that we will have an outdoor watch party at the Parsonage, and everything will be socially distant and compliant with um, sort of the, the guidelines we have set up for our church. Again, we are collecting these items for Edwards Children's Home, from now until Sunday, January 10th, if you need a list, let me know, and I will give you a list so that we can continue our collection period. This day, Wednesday, we will be continuing our Zoom devotional study on the histories and lessons of the hymns that we sing at Christmas. This week, we are specifically looking at the song, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. And if you want to learn more about how the study goes, then you can connect with me at the church or talk to us about Gibson or... Donnie and Jennifer Hope. And finally, this Thursday at 7 p.m., we have our next grief share meeting. Grief share, of course, is a crisis center support group for anyone who has lost loved ones and is finding themselves in need of a community that understands such grief. We're still meeting at St. Paul UFC in their social hall, which is the old fellowship hall, and we will be meeting once a week until March 4th, with the exception of Christmas Eve. Those are all of the announcements that I have this morning, friends. Today is the third Sunday of Advent, and it is the Sunday where we observe peace, how Jesus is our Prince of Peace, and how we are called to co-create peace with Christ and with the Holy Spirit and with God, our Father Almighty. With all of that said, let us go to God in prayer. Let us pray. Merciful God, you come into our midst longing for communion with us, becoming one with us. Break our resistance to life with you, show us the path towards just relations, and bring us into your unimaginable peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, our opening hymn this morning is Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. Let us sing together silently in our hearts or hum along as we wish.
Bowie, this is found on page 887 in our hymnals. And for the moment that we have during COVID-19, we are adapting it to be more call and response, like a church of old. So my friends, I ask you this question, to which you will respond, no, in all things we are more than conquerors through the one who loved us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all things we are more than conquerors through the one who loved us. Indeed, we are sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. My friends, together let us say, thanks be to God. Amen. Thanks be to God. Amen. We have our first scripture and our only scripture for the morning. It comes from Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 4 and 8 through 11. In our good news. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence. As when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down, and the mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who works for those who wait for him. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father, we are the clay, and you are our potter. We are the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Do not consider we are all your people. Your holy cities have become a wilderness. Zion has become a wilderness. Jerusalem a desolation. A holy and beautiful house where our ancestors praised you has been burned by fire, and all our pleasant places have become ruins. My friends, this is the word of God for all people. Thanks be to God. At this time, I call our sister Margaret Ann to play this morning's anthem for us. Our anthem for reflection this month is this is the day of new beginnings. Spirit, and may the words of our mouth 
the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So this is a question asked of all of us. A question from Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8. A question that the heavenly hosts asks the prophet, Who will go for us and who will we send? In the midst of civil unrest and record unemployment and political and polarization and economic uncertainty and COVID-19, this scripture from Isaiah answers the question, who, when he says, here I am, send me. The first part of Isaiah asks, or answers the who, and the last part of Isaiah answers the how. Isaiah says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Here we see that the prophet explains how any kind of preacher must go. We must always be drawn back to the central question of who and how. But we are called to preach, and that would be all of us based on our baptism. That's what St. Jerome says in the 4th century. Jerome declared that baptism is the ordination of the laity. It is not just the role of the ordained to preach good news. No, all of us, each who has received God's grace, we are all called to preach and pronounce and proclaim to a sin-filled world the good news of God's saving work. And our scripture today tells us how we are to do the work of sharing faith. Isaiah simply says, don't try this preaching thing unless the Spirit of the Lord is upon you. He didn't say, don't try it if you haven't been licensed. Don't try it if you haven't been commissioned. Don't try it if you haven't been ordained. And this preaches to us, people who identify as both saints and sinners. Don't preach without the Spirit of God. That same Spirit that hovered over the formless chaos void. The same Spirit that carried the creative will of God. This preacher... Isaiah says to all of us, no matter our demographic, our difference, whether we are people that can trace our Methodist roots back for generations, or people who have no idea what the Methodist movement came from, how it responded, and what the needs were that it met. If you're going to declare a word to the weary, if you're going to proclaim good news against what my friend Reggie Lee calls a brassy sky, then you had better go in the power of God's creative spirit. So how are we going to preach with the power of God while COVID-19 continues to cast its long shadow of death? How are we going to preach in a nation divided by race and class and, yes, political affiliation? We've tried a lot of other things. We've tried a lot of human conventions. But Isaiah, our preacher prophet for the morning, says that we ought to preach with the creative energy of the Lord God. If we are to faithfully confront the chaos of our day, then we need the Spirit of the Lord to rise and rest upon us. This text today suggests some guidance for our preaching. First, let us not accept any assignment to preach to weary people before we have received the anointing of the Spirit of the Lord ourselves. The prophet Isaiah knew that he couldn't do it alone. He needed the Lord's Spirit. He knew that Zion, another name for Jerusalem, which was the geographical area of Judea, he knew that Zion, he knew that the people of Jerusalem were in ruins from the ground up. They were weary from more than 40 years of captivity, weary from being disconnected from the land that gave them life and the longing of former days of old when the temple was lying in ruins and the city was not pushed down by poverty and political anarchy. They were tired and tired of being tired. And Isaiah knows that without the Spirit of the Lord God, no preacher would be able to stay in the battlefield. No preacher would be able to preach prophetically in a poverty-stricken, politically fragile city like Jerusalem. We need the power of the Lord God. We must preach because the Lord has anointed us, has sent us to 
bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release the prisoners. We must preach with the power of the Lord, although the news we listen to rehearses the ills of our society. We must preach even though the secular news simply reports those statistics and stories that reinforce negativity in our nation and bear witness that the soul of the nation is in jeopardy. The lead story is seldom the good news category. And yet we must find a note of grace in a sad song and preach good news in these bad times. Yes, the people of Israel had been deported. Yes, the nation's religious life represented by Jerusalem, the golden, had been ransacked. Yet the preacher has good news because the preacher has been saturated and filled up and covered in the creative spirit of the Eternal One. And this preacher is called and commanded to preach good news in bad times. In COVID-19, we need to be anointed with the spirit of Messiah, not only to announce the word, but to be co-creators of good news in bad times. The second piece of advice that our scripture gives us for today is this. But the word of God has been made flesh, but without the anointing of the Messiah, then we, the church, simply just make it word again. Isaiah isn't simply suggesting that we preach the word, but that we also embody it, that we give it flesh and blood and energy and make it live. Those who have been rebuked and scorned, those who have been talked about, sure, as you were born, the widow living off the mic, the single mother trying to make ends meet, the senior citizens living off their social security, trying to decide whether to buy meat or medicine. They long for a word that can make life abundant, a healing word, a comforting word, a word that offers audacious hope and ministry to reach out to those in need, bringing good news in bad times. Now, many will approach this Advent season by asking, is there any good news? Empty chairs and turned down plates and the missing touch of a vanished hand will bring us face to face with brokenness. And many are being held captive in the broken places of missed opportunity. Others are actually incarcerated in prisons designed for profit. Who will go and declare good news? What can our church do to announce and assist in the setting free of the captives. Israel, of course, had been captive in Babylon, and before that they had been captive in Egypt. But where are the places that find us, people who identify with the nation Israel? Where are the places that find our family and our church and our community? What is holding us hostage? What way of thinking has made us prisoners? Because there's good news. The church and its baptized believers are empowered by the Spirit of God and anointed to carry good news in bad times. This is a word to the outcast. We read that in Isaiah, that God has come to bring good news to the oppressed and the brokenhearted and the captives and the prisoners. Are these the kinds of folks that are on our radio screen? Because that's a scandal of God. God cares for those who are living on the margins, often in silent sight of our communities of faith, but rarely in the hearts of the established assembly of believers. And the third piece of advice that the scripture gives us, people who are told to preach good news, we're to announce the year of the Lord's favor, which is a day of vengeance, or, or better yet, a, a day of vindication. In God's timing, Israel's fortunes will be reversed, and the nations will turn knowledge, and that knowledge, excuse me, Israel's legitimacy. Who will go was settled in Isaiah chapter 6. We said that earlier. But here in the 61st chapter, Isaiah shows us how we go in the anointed spirit, the Messiah, the anointed one. 
And we are sent not only to the city center or to the favored and privileged ones. No, my friends, we, this Advent season, are being sent by God to the meek and to the weak and to the lowly, to captives and prisoners and to the brokenhearted. Here the prophet announces grace to the forgotten. He announces hope to the hopeless. He offers justifying grace to prove to the oppressors that the oppressed will not be pressed down forever. The last part of Isaiah that we are reading today is announcing what some call the gospel of particularity. This is good news to the poor who's, who, who have been described by the late Howard Thurman, scholar, mystic, he called the poor the disinherited, those whose backs are against the wall. And good news to those living life in anonymity on life's margins. That is what this scripture brings to us today. God has loved us in such a way that God gives us grace before we even know that we need it. And that is marshaled through human history, through God's divine will, to bring us to a glorious and godly heritage through justifying grace. That all may see us full of dignity and divinity. And while the powerful scoff at the promises of God, there is a purposeful and powerful and particular plan unfolding to save the least and the lost. It is the year of the Lord. And we can't bring it, but all of the places where we have dared to proclaim through word and deed, they're like breadcrumbs leading to the coming of the Lamb of God, those whose kingdom will come and enable us to know and live in that beloved community. My friends, there is good news coming for those whom justice has evaded. That is the last piece of advice that our scripture has for us today. A day of vindication and justice is on its way, and crowds are gathering in the streets of the nations around the world, crying out, no justice, no peace. An advent and the day of vindication is coming for those whose backs have been against the wall. This word of liberation, spoken first under the anointing of the Lord's Spirit, is spoken by the power of the Lord's Messiah. You recall that Jesus in Luke chapter 4, verses 17 through 19. When he goes to preach in his hometown, he takes the scroll of Isaiah and he turns exactly to the passage that says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the prisoners, and recovery of sight to the blind, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. My friends, we are the preaching congregation, anointed and assigned to bring good news in bad times. In the name of God, the Creator, and Christ, the Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit, our Sustainer. Amen. As we continue our worship for this morning, we come to the time where we share with one another the prayer request that we made at the beginning of the service. We lift up Miss Yvonne's cousin, Molly. We lift up the Roger and Roberts family, and David Wirtz, and Carol Garrett, and Harvey Saul, and his family. We lift up so many people in our congregation who are not feeling well for various reasons. We want to pray for our dearly beloved member, Mr. Luke Bledsoe. This morning, for our prayer of intercession, there will be a moment where I say the words, God, you are in our midst, at which point I ask that you respond with the words, renew us in your love. So my friends, if you will, let us join together and go to God in prayer. Let us pray. Lord of life, you call us to prepare the way for your reign by bearing fruit worthy of repentance. You 
lift up a vision before us of a world that is shared and is fair, where needs are met and no one is an outcast. Baptize us fresh in your spirit as we pray. God, you are in our midst. Renew us in your love. We pray for the nations of the world with allies and enemies, for their leaders and their people. Make yourself known to us all, that all the peoples of the earth may live in justice and peace. God, you are in our midst. Renew us in your love. For your church here and abroad, that we hear your call for justice as good news for all people. God, you are in our midst. Renew us in your love. We pray for peace in our world, especially for those caught in war, and for all who live in fear of violence, extortion, threats, and false accusations. God, you are in our midst. Renew us in your love. For those who suffer from natural disasters, of hunger and cold, lead us to share our food and our coats with them. God, you are in our midst. Renew us in your love. For the frail, the sick, and those whose hands grow weak, renew us and lead us to help them with gentleness. God, you are in our midst. Renew us in your love. Lord God, we thank you that you are one who is able to Renew us in your love and be in our midst, even when we have not deserved it. We pray that we may be worthy of your repentance, especially in these coming days as we await the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Whose holy name we pray. Amen. My friends, thank you as always for being in worship this morning. I'm grateful for your generosity, as always, in continued support of our tithes and offerings. One more final quick announcement. Uh, we are grateful for all the ways that Ms. Margaret Ann has been able to be with us and be our accompanist for, for many, many years now. We are taking up a love offering for her this Sunday and next Sunday. There are two plates, uh, one in the front pew on this side and one in the back. They are brown in color. If you would, please bring an offering uh, that we may share our gratitude and our appreciation for Ms. Margaret Ann. Know that we both love you. Know that we are here for you. Know that I am praying for and with you. Know that if you have any needs or if you or loved one tests positive or becomes affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, that I am here for you. We will aid you in any contact tracing as necessary. Our final hymn for the morning is Savior of the Nations Come. Please join me once again in singing silently in your hearts and having along as we do. Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you and through us all now.